Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And today my guest is a man who until recently was right at the heart of communication between the German parliament and the German military. And here he is, Reinhold Robber. Thank Hello. you very much for joining us today on Talking Germany. Now, uh, for five years until 2010, Reinhold Robber was Germany's parliamentary commissioner for the armed forces. This at a time when the Bundeswehr, as the military is known here in Germany, was and still is facing greater challenges than ever before. And by the way, Reinhold Robber has an intriguing new job, which we'll also be talking about. So I think it's going to be very interesting to hear what he has to say about the following topics. Troubled troops more than perhaps anybody else, Reinhold Robber has devoted his time and energy to listening to the concerns of members of Germany's armed forces. Career soldiers, Germany is scrapping conscription and moving towards a fully professional army, but getting young people to sign up is a challenge. And special relationship. These days, Reinhold Robber is the president of the German-Israeli Society, which works to promote solidarity between the two countries. <clears throat> Reinhold Robber, for five years, you were the federal commissioner for the armed forces here in Germany, and I'm very interested to know a little bit more about what that job is actually about. Is the job about talking with the troops or talking for the troops? Also, äh, diese Tätigkeit ist eine deutsche Besonderheit. Also der This position is something that is particular to Germany. The Commissioner to the Armed Forces was created together with the Bundeswehr as a result of the experiences we had with Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. The aim was to ensure that the Bundeswehr, the new German army, could not in any way be misused for political means, as was the case with the German army under Hitler. That is why Parliament, and in particular the opposition, said we need a powerful supervisory body. Germany followed the Scandinavian example, where there is also an ombudsman for the military, and introduced a parliamentary commissioner for the armed forces. The constitution was amended, that is important. The parliamentary commissioner has a lot of political clout. He cannot act in an executive way, he has no power to direct, but among other things he does represent the soldiers' interests. That's the point. He gets okay. the, the commissioner, the ombudsman, as you call it, gets complaints from the soldiers. Just before we move on a little bit, give me an idea of how many complaints on a, on a yearly basis does the ombudsman get? During the course of a year, some five and a half to six thousand soldiers approach the parliamentary commissioner to the armed forces in writing. All these six thousand petitions are looked into by the commissioner. Not on his own, of course. He has a team of around 50 staff members who assist him. The commissioner gathers information by making unannounced visits. Most politicians say they are coming, and there's a huge program organized for them, and sometimes they don't get to see things as they really are. That's the, it's the way to do it. It's the way to do it. The, but the point I'm getting is that you get a lot of complaints in the job. The German for armed forces, it seems, are disgruntled. We'll have to talk about that. Reinhold Robert, from that report, we learnt a lot of interesting things. But the most interesting thing for me is that you were one of the first German politicians to say that German forces in Afghanistan are fighting in a war. Why did it take so long for Germany to face up to the fact that that is the case? When we talk about war here in Germany, a lot of people, especially those who experienced the last World War, think of the destruction in cities like Berlin, Cologne or Dresden. 
Many disregard the fact that we now live in a completely different situation. The world has changed fundamentally, and Germany has also changed in the past 60 years. We are a new country with a stable democracy. We are among the world's leading economic nations, and we have to accept our responsibility, especially in view of the way, after World War II, our allies helped us regain the standard we now enjoy once again. That involves commitments. We cannot just keep on making demands and looking at the positive aspects. We must recognize the responsibilities we have in the world. Okay, okay, but you're talking about Germany's historical legacy and the responsibility that comes from that. But the, the fact of the matter is, as you pointed out in your reports when you were the commissioner, you said that the, the Bundeswehr troops are fighting on the ground, but, quote, they need more training, more vehicles, more weapons. That's concrete. Yeah. That is the contradiction. Unfortunately, our society hasn't spent enough time discussing the necessity that has arisen from Germany's changed role. If policymakers don't have the courage to tell people the truth and describe things the way they really are, for example in Afghanistan, then it is to be expected that the man on the street, the normal citizen, is not prepared to spend money on things that are necessary. Things that are unfortunately necessary, I might add. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about conscription quickly. The German army is going through a process of reform. Conscription is being scrapped, a more professional army, a fully professional army. You're unhappy about that. Why? Weil ich sage, dass ähm, die politisch Verantwortlichen nicht ehrlich mit äh In my opinion, the policymakers who are responsible don't deal with facts in an honest way. They don't tell people the honest truth. Everyone knows that if you want to reform something, you have to spend money. If you want to reorganize a company, it costs money. You have to be prepared to make investments, so that later on everything becomes less expensive, more cost-effective and more lucrative. Here we're doing things the wrong way around. The former defense minister zu Gutenberg said the reform was being made to save money, and that's the false approach. At the same time, conscription was abolished, and now we're facing a situation where not enough people want to join an unattractive army. And that's what we're going to talk about next, because what the scrapping of conscription means is that, as Reinhold Robber put it, the Bundeswehr now needs to find many more young men and women who are willing to sign up for a long-term career in the military. Uh, the problem is, though, that is not going to be easy. Rising to challenges. Mastering technology. The Bundeswehr reform. Your opportunity. The German armed forces are looking for volunteers with large-scale marketing campaigns. And these are the first to join up at this barracks in Rheinland-Pfalz. Young men from all over Germany are joining the military voluntarily. It's their first day in the armed forces. From now on, their life is ruled by orders. They want to become radio operators or drivers. After a year, they'll also be deployed abroad. I've just finished my job training, and the Bundeswehr does a lot of further education in various professions, so I thought I might eventually get my Master Craftsman's diploma. Think you'll be deployed abroad? Anything's possible. Are you okay with that? Yes. Not everyone comes back, it can be dangerous. That's true, but you don't assume that for sure, even if you do go there. Until now, the Bundeswehr called up 16,000 conscripts four times a year. It's hoped nearly the same number of volunteers will take their place. But whether that happens remains to be seen. These days, few people choose a profession in the armed forces. What do your friends say? They accept it. They tell me to think very carefully about everything that might happen and weigh up the pros and cons. But in the end, nobody influenced my decision. It's clear that the Bundeswehr has to become more attractive, especially for potential volunteers. 
Das wird eine schwierige Aufgabe werden, auf jeden Fall. Da brauchen wir nicht It will be a tough job, no matter what. No sense in beating about the bush. We have to enhance our appeal to attract better educated people and officer candidates, not to make ourselves a refuge for those who haven't got a chance outside the military. It's to be an attractive army that pays well, offers good training facilities and takes care of the soldiers' families. What's not clear is how that'll be funded. Rising to challenges. The reform of the armed forces is first of all a challenge for politicians. The Bundeswehr reform, your opportunity. We were talking, uh, Reinhold, Robert and I, while we were listening to that report, and we were talking about the differences between the attitude towards the military in my home country, in the UK, and in Germany. And we, what we've learned in the programme so far is that people have been reluctant to face up to war, the fact that Germany's at war, and, people, and there aren't enough young people willing to join the forces. Is the problem, perhaps, that Germany simply doesn't have a culture of acceptance for the military? There are a lot of reservations towards anything military because of Germany's past. There is a deep-rooted pacifism. Now that isn't necessarily something negative, especially in view of the fact that there was a fascist Germany under Hitler, responsible for the murder of six million Jews and people who thought differently. But we must simply realize that in the current situation in the world, in North Africa, for example, we cannot just have an opinion, we must also accept a responsibility. And that people actually go to war and die. They suffer and die in these wars. I mean, in Germany here in 2009, not very long ago, the, the, the government wanted to open a memorial to the fallen German soldiers, soldiers who had lost their lives through the years fighting for the Bundeswehr. And people were protesting against that. People were not very happy about that. That would seem remarkable in other countries. Yeah, that is uh, for an... That's unimaginable for people from Britain or the US. The fact that there is such a huge discrepancy between the civilian population and the people fulfilling their duty in the armed forces and assuming Germany's responsibility around the world for their fellow citizens. That has to do with the fact that politicians, and I make no exceptions, whether it is the current coalition government or the opposition, have excluded certain things for many years. That is why, to this day, a lot of people make no distinction between the political evaluation of a military operation, for example in Afghanistan, and the things a soldier has to do in view of his health and safety. When someone returns home wounded or loses a comrade, then a lot of people back home often say, how can you be so stupid to go on such a mission? I have a good job in industry. I earn more than you do and earn much more recognition than you do. Why do you do it? That isn't just an unhealthy situation. It's an intolerable situation. That's why it really gets to me. And that is why, after I left my position as parliamentary commissioner, I decided I would become a voluntary advocate for the soldiers' needs and try to do something toward ending this intolerable discrepancy. Mm. But let's just talk about another aspect of this, the emotional aspect that you're talking about, because it's not just about people going to Afghanistan, for example, and maybe coming back wounded. It's not just about people doing their duties. Sometimes, certainly in other countries, the UK, France, the US, people have a military culture where somebody can go and fight in a war like this and become a hero. That's, that is an idea that in Germany just doesn't exist. Ganz genau. Exactly. In a worst case scenario here in Germany, a soldier is accused of being a murderer or spat at in Hamburg or other large cities. I have heard of such incidents occurring. 
London und in, in New York und Washington. In London, Held, New York oder Washington. Und, uh, a soldier is seen as a hero. These examples clearly show how wide the gap is between reality and what is called for and change is called for. Things must change in this country. And that can only happen if you are A, open about terminology, and B, aware of the fact that soldiers are not going on foreign missions just for fun or because they feel like it. They're being sent on these missions by the German parliament, and anyone who discusses this issue must be aware of that. Point taken. Now, uh, we're going to move on a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, uh, since October 2010, Reinhold Robber has been the president of an organization called the German Israeli Society. Let's just have a quick look at some of the images now from the eastern German city of Erfurt, the ceremony where Reinhold Robber took up office. And while we're going to look at these images, perhaps Reinhold could tell us a little bit more about the goals of that organization. <laughs> Achso, ähm, meine Aufgabe als Präsident besteht... My duty as president is to a large extent to communicate. As president of this society with 5,000 members in 50 working groups throughout Germany, my job is to maintain contacts at a national level with Parliament, our government, as well as with the many friendly organizations, the Central Council of Jews in Germany, the Society for Christian-Jewish Cooperation, and the trade associations. That is my job. Okay, but let's pin it down. The organization is an organization trying to promote solidarity and partnership with Israel. Okay, uh, let me quote a headline to you that was, um, that was in the New York Times not very long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, and the headline ran, A Deepening Rift Between Germany and Israel. Yeah? It's, a, it's a difficult time for you to be president of this organization. How worrying is that rift for you? Things have changed regarding the bilateral relations between Israel and Germany. The further the Holocaust and the founding of the State of Israel lie in the past, the more interest here declines regarding the situation in the Middle East and Israel. When you speak to young people these days, who maybe haven't had a lot of history lessons, then sometimes they have absolutely no interest at all. I was going to say, I mean, young people here in Germany, they, 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 let, let's be honest, it's a sad truth, but they know more about Auschwitz and the Holocaust than they do about Israel. Yeah. That is also true. And that is why I say that we as a society, as a German-Israeli society, can contribute to altering this unhappy situation to a certain extent. I want to try to direct public interest away from the major problems that still exist in Israel. The settlement problem and the unresolved peace issue. I'm afraid that we will still be tackling these issues in 20 to 30 years' time. So you want, us to, you want us to view Israel as a normal state? It is a normal state, of course. But there are special relationship networks between Germany and Israel that must play a major role in our relations, that mustn't lead us to taking special consideration, for example, in discussions. But I would like to further things in a positive way, by highlighting the many cultural projects that exist in Israel, to promote interest among young people and society as a whole here in Germany. Okay, okay. Another aspect of Reinhold Robber is that he comes from a part of Germany right up in the northwest that's called East Frisia. We're going to find out a little bit from him about this area. Uh, here's a totally uh, unrepresentative survey of what people here in Germany say about the people of the area, the East Frisians. Low green flat countryside. There's an awful East Frisian cake. I don't like it. It's got raisins and rum in it. 
You can see a long way. There are dikes, it's very windy, and there are windmills. And there are cows. <laughs> Tea and the landscape. It's so flat, you can see who's coming to visit tomorrow. Those yellow rainproof jackets. Don't you know them? New Year's pastries and cows and kale and lovely countryside and peaceful people. I think of those blue and white striped shirts. I used to have one myself. Stubbornness. Why stubbornness? Because the East Frisians are all pretty stubborn, but it suits them. Well, well. <laughs> well uh, the, the most important thing about East Frisia that people outside there in the big wide world need to know is that it's very flat. Yeah? What's the highest point of land in East Frisia? Well, I would say 30 to 40 meters, a small hill in my hometown of Leer. In my Heimatstadt Leer. Okay. Um, tea or coffee, we heard that, uh, that, that tea is very popular. Yeah? Are you a tea drinker yourself? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I'm at home in East Frisia, we drink tea at least four, five or six times a day. A tea ceremony involves at least three cups of tea, mostly five or six, and well into the night. My principle is always to drink tea in East Frisia because the tap water there is much better than in Berlin or elsewhere. When I'm away from home, in Berlin for example, then I drink coffee. Yeah. Okay, and uh, we heard from that report those, what the people were saying about the people of East Frisia, that they're very uh, stubborn. Are you stubborn? Not at all. No. Let other people be the judge of that. Journalists. Okay, okay. Are you are you slow are you slow witted, Mr. Robert? Are you slow witted? Uh, <laughs> this is what they say about people from East Frisia, isn't it? They say that you lot are not very intelligent. <laughs> I wouldn't say so. I think we're sensible Central Europeans. But we have been influenced somewhat by external influences. For example, by the fact that for centuries we had to protect our land from invading forces as well as the high tides. And that is why at some point we started building dikes. And people in East Frisia gained experience as everywhere else. But seriously, this ongoing battle with the elements has affected our mentality to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, we're going to wrap up now. We're going to move on to our Talking Germany, our traditional Talking Germany quiz at the end of the show. I give you two alternatives. Quick uh, response, yeah? Um, we heard about the cake, the Ostfriesen cake. Rum or raisins? Your choice. Uh, rum. Mountains or plains? Plains. Conscription army or professional army? Definitely a conscription army. Germany should have said yes or no to Libya. The resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. When it comes to military challenges, is Germany a country like every other or not? Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Firm word there from Reinhold Robber. He's been our guest today here on Talking Germany, telling us all about the German army and the significance thereof. If you've enjoyed the show as much as I have on his company, then do come back next week. Until then, just...